For more on this, I want to bring in Ed Morrissey. He's the managing editor of Hot Air, and he joins us now. Hello, Ed. Good to talk to you, sir. Good to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. What do you make of uh, Joe Biden's flailing presidency? Well, I make of it the same way I made of his flailing political career up until the, up until the time he became president. <laughs> um, and this, this is a guy who's perpetually in over his head, and it shows. Mm-hmm. And and I think it's coming across, and that's the reason why. And I think that the the the, the fulcrum of this was the abominable, disgraceful uh, route out of Afghanistan, leaving yeah. Americans behind, uh, clearly making all of the wrong decisions on how to execute that plan, um, and basically abandoning our allies. I think it was a disgrace. I think Americans realized that. And that's the moment, I think, that the scales really fell from the eyes about, um, you know, of the electorate about the nature of Joe Biden. Yes. And, and it's, he's never recovered from that. And I remember writing about a month, oh, it was about almost exactly two years ago that I was writing that, that this was a watershed moment and that it was, it was going to completely and permanently change the way that people saw Joe Biden. They said, oh, and, you know, people were saying, oh, no, this is the economy. This is the economy. No, it's not. It's Afghanistan. And it's not because they, it's not so much because they opposed what happened, which was part of it, but because they were disgusted by what happened. Yes. And I don't think it's ever, ever, ever changed. No, and and every so often there's a sustainer that keeps the story alive, and people recognize just how bad things were uh, during that, that drawdown. So an example of that is the Gold Star families who've been out in recent weeks uh, who lost their loved ones in the bombing at the Abbey Gate there at the airport, uh, and they are just they, – they, they think that Joe Biden is a disgrace. They've said it out loud. They've said it publicly. Uh, and that Biden campaign, that Democrat Party, has to be kind of reeling right now with that reaction from the Gold Star families. Well, I think so. I mean, and I think this is going to keep coming up every year at the same time. I mean, the same time that they're going to be having conventions next year, it's going to be coming up again. And I don't know that they're going to get away from this until Biden is no longer president. And I don't see them. I don't see that they have a plan for that in the next year or so they're they're going to have to run biden again because they don't really have much of a choice it seems like they don't have a plan i i noticed um you know chuck todd had franklin four on his rate on his uh, television show this week on meet the press and franklin right. four is the uh, biographer who spent some time inside the, the biden white house talked to a lot of the biden staffers and, and has created quite a few headlines in recent weeks with excerpts of the book and Chuck Todd had asked him pretty specifically on the timeline. He said, if if Joe Biden were to uh, announce that he wasn't running for reelection by the end of this year, would you be surprised? And Franklin Ford responded, it'd be a little surprised, but not really. He wouldn't be that surprised. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Chuck Todd was saying by the end of the year, I, I, I could be reading too much into it, but it seems like the kind of thing Chuck Todd runs in those circles uh, and to even lay out a timeline line like that on a prominent Sunday show. Uh, it, Democrats have to be worried. Well, I would say that that's too late of a deadline. I mean, if you're talking about having a full primary on the Democrat side, you really need to start like right now. You probably needed to start a couple of months ago. Um, if you wait until the end of the year to say that you're not running for president, um, you know, in 1968, you could get away with that, right? Because nobody really started their presidential campaigns until about a month or so prior to Iowa and New Hampshire. Right. That's no longer the case. It takes a long time to pull these things together. There's a lot of money that has to go into these things. There's a lot of organization that has to go into these things. And nobody is doing that kind of organization well, because Joe Biden's incumbent. What if the answer, though, Ed, is that they don't want a primary? What if the answer is that if he does it late in the process, well, I guess we're just going to have to crown someone. We can't go through a full primary process. Well, then then they're absolutely stuck with Kamala Harris. They're absolutely stuck with Kamala Harris, and here's why. They put Kamala Harris on the ticket in 2020 because the Democrat Party absolutely was demanding a diversity ticket, right? And they wanted a woman of color at the top of the ticket. Uh, and they didn't get it because Kamala Harris was, was the – the person who was most likely to uh, to to grab that ring, so to speak, and she utterly flopped in the primaries, uh, and so they ended up having to nominate another old white guy, Joe Biden, one of the oldest old white guys that they had. Not the oldest. Bernie Sanders was still there, but uh, but but one of them, and um, Biden made it. Biden made it explicit that he was going to pick a woman of color as his running mate yeah. for the future, 
right? So that the next time out, they would have the diversity, uh, they would have the diversity ticket at the top of the ticket the way that they all wanted. Yes. So the, he picks Kamala Harris to do this, even though she was terrible at this. Yes, and right. and she impugned him on stage. She said she suggested she implied that he was a stone cold racist during their debate, uh, right. and he ended up picking her as his running mate anyway. Right. Yeah. I mean, then there's reasons for that too that you can you can explain away. But I mean, he would have been much better off picking somebody like Val Demings, who's actually competent, at, you know, at politics and competent at policy. I don't agree with her policies, but she's competent. Um, but he picks Kamala Harris. So if the, if the if it comes down to a brokered convention, if you will, or you, you know, or, or the smoke filled back room, however you want to describe a non primary process of finding a nominee, and it's not Kamala Harris who was picked explicitly to be the next in line, you're going to have a meltdown among Democrats, among the, um, uh, similar to what happened when uh, Gavin Newsom picked, picked Alex Padilla rather than Karen Bass um, or uh, Barbara Lee for that Senate slot. Um, you're going to have a war of identity politics that yes. breaks out in, in among the Democrats. And so that's so how don't. captured that's how captured they are by that issue, though identity yeah. politics. That it, it is it is more meaningful to them than electability. Because I'm looking at, you know, NBC News has a story this weekend that basically Democrat elites are excited about Biden, but the base isn't, and they don't know how to convince the base to be excited about Biden. And in that piece, they quote uh, a former senator from Arizona, a Democrat by the name of Dennis DeConcini. He's 86 oh, yeah. years old now. And he said that Biden is too old for this job. Uh, but his, he said the problem that Democrats have is that Kamala Harris is unelectable. He doesn't think that she can be elected. So if right. it comes down to this drama, Ed Morrissey, they are going they, – they would rather lose the White House with Kamala Harris than win with someone else? Yeah, I think it's because they feel that Donald Trump's going to be the nominee and they can't lose. And I think that they're willing to roll that dice, even though Kamala – Harris is an incompetent. I mean, she's worse than Biden. What has she done? What yes, she done? at least he I, has the excuse of age. Well, I mean, and point me to even a speech that she gave that was successful or a foreign policy tour. She has yet to have one of those. Right. Every time she steps out, she uh, does a pratfall. So I think that they're, they're – their feeling is that they simply can't lose as long as Republicans can be goaded into nominating Donald Trump. And, uh, and and I think that that's probably at least the more likely outcome, at least at this moment in time. If we had the primaries today, that would be the outcome. We've still got five months uh, or four months now of, of events that could take place that things might change quite a bit. Yes. But but at any rate, I think that that's what their their rationale is: is that well, we really don't have to worry about it. Um, but you, if they're going to have a primary, I mean, we're already in September. I was thinking when we started this conversation. Oh, it's August. No, it's actually September. I yes. forgot about that. I mean, there's not a lot of time to, for Democrats to pull together a primary. They're not even set up to do debates. I mean, they're just they, they don't have the framework for this. The DNC is set up to reelect um, Joe Biden. Uh, and they're not set up for anything else. It would take a tremendous amount of effort to convert that, and they'd have to make that decision like right now or sometime this month just to get the just to get the wheels yeah. turning on something like that. If they yeah. wait, if Biden waits until Christmas to say, "Well, I'm I'm just not going to do it again," uh, I mean, you could do it, but it's going to be a mess. And I think if you wait that long, it, it almost has to be uh, Kamala Harris. If he had said in June. I'm not going to do it again. Then you have at least a process that can begin. And if she can't make it through that process, then that's more on her than it, it's still going to create the resentments. But at least you can say, well, it was more on her. But if you wait till the end of the year or, or if you wait until, you know, yeah. summer of well, next year when, when they have to do it in a smoke filled back room. It's it's a disaster for them. And there's and there's no evidence on on the Kamala Harris as the uh, heir apparent uh, front. There's no evidence that they're currently doing anything to burnish her reputation. Like if that was the if that right. was the the thought process right now, you'd probably see the White House putting Kamala out more at various public events and suggesting that she was the mastermind behind some success that they could try and point to. But you're not even seeing any of that at the moment. No, that's because there isn't any of that to do. Yes. <laughs> I mean, Can, Honestly, that's we all know that that's true. 
she didn't do anything in the Senate either. I mean, this is not a mystery. No. She didn't do anything in the Senate either. Uh, she didn't really do a whole lot as AG in California. Uh, I mean, she's, she's basically an insider that's, you know, writing the insider track. Um, there's no evidence that she is competent in any way, shape, or form. There's a lot of evidence to the contrary. What do you make of all these Democrats who keep going on media and saying, boy, Joe Biden has just been such a great success when it comes to the economy and bipartisan achievements, and he's not getting any of the credit he deserves, and voters are overstating their economic pain right now. Actually, they're much better than they even know. Yeah. I mean, you can try selling that. Uh, The media is trying to sell that, too, but... I mean that's that's where that's where politics meets reality. You can make those type of you can you can say oh we're more respected in uh, in the world because of my foreign policy and most people don't even have a personal connection to that. So you can kind of get away with that, right? You can you can talk about well I've been I've been really hard on deficit spending. That's another Biden claim even though deficits are ballooning again. And again, most people don't live that day to day. They live the economy day to day. You can't that's 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 one that you can't just pass off, and uh, I'm I, I suspect that they're going to discover, and they probably have been discovering because they've been running this Bidenomics playbook now for a couple of months, and his poll numbers aren't budging at all, not even on the economy. It's a no sale. Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna buy into it. Finally, you mentioned you talk about um, on the Republican side, you know, that we still have a primary going on, but Donald Trump has a massive lead in that primary. It looks like he's en route to becoming the nominee again. Uh, and uh, at this moment, uh, some some hope on the Republican side because he is polling uh, neck and neck with Joe Biden, uh, dead even in the Wall Street Journal poll. If you're polling at a national level at those numbers, that bodes well for the Electoral College. Uh, you know, what do you make of Trump's chances next year if he does become the nominee? Clearly, I, I agree with you. I think Democrats have had it uh, in their minds that they would uh, try and tarnish his reputation in a primary process, make him more popular among his base, and then defeat him in a general. I'm not so certain that's going to happen, though. Well, I mean, I, 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 there's the, the pundit uh, graveyard is littered with gravestones that said, I, I predicted Donald Trump's demise. <laughs> yes. I mean, so I, I don't want to go there, but I find it very difficult to believe, especially in an electoral college sense, that he's going to be able to do it. I, you know, he, is he going to win Arizona again? No. Is he going to win Pennsylvania again? No. Is he going to win Michigan again like he did in uh, 2016? No. Um, you know, it, just in practical terms, he ran against Joe Biden, who is one of the um, biggest blowhards and known to be one of the biggest blowhards, a, a serial plagiarist. He ran against Joe Biden in 2020 and lost. While he was incumbent, <laughs> while he had the power of the presidency at his command, um, so Mike, I, I mean, I think it's a fair, I think it's at least a fair bet to say as a, as a rematch that he's probably not going to do well again. Um, he is a Democrat turnout machine, and I, that's one of the things that happened in 2020 is that Democrats were motivated to turn out. They turned out in large, large, large numbers to vote against him. Mm-hmm. And I suspect that the same thing is going to be true in 2024 if he ends up with the nomination. Yeah. Well, especially uh, if Democrats maintain a tyrannical stranglehold of, over all of our institutions that they used and abused going into the 2020 election uh, into next year as well. And we're, we're seeing a version of that now as a number of Democrats are looking to even get Trump removed from the ballot for fear that voters yeah, might, I mean, that's just might choose I mean, that's him. Just, that's just dumb. I mean, really, and it really plays into – Trump's hands in that in that particular sense because they're doing what they're accusing Trump of doing. Andy McCarthy has a great column at, about that at NRO. They're doing they're doing what they're accusing Trump of doing, which is to undermine which is undermining the institutions and undermining elections uh, to get a uh, to get an outcome that uh, they prefer. Uh, it's it's a it's a very very corrosive argument. Big time. It's 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 really dumb. But um, again. He had, I mean, again, he won in 2016, and the left had, the left had a firm grip on all those institutions. He still won in 2016 against Hillary Clinton, uh, and then he was in charge of the but, White House and lost in 2020. I mean, but the big difference between 16 and 20 is how much control over the flow of information they had. So in 16, uh, social media was a much more open environment. After he won in 16. They did everything they could to strangle the ability of the American voter to get accurate information leading up to that election, and that was by design. Yeah, and that's and that's by design. And I, and I grant you that, but 
but even if that's the case, it's gotten worse since then, with the exception of Twitter. Yeah. And um, and and so again, I, I, I'm not going to count him out if he wins the nomination, but I am very skeptical that there's an opening in, in, on the electoral college path to 270 for him because there, you know. He's not going to win Michigan. He's not going to win Pennsylvania. Democrats are 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 very strong in both of those states now. Um, I, I'm not sure he could win Wisconsin again, and Arizona and Georgia probably uh, Georgia maybe especially. Uh, and so where do you where do you go to get the 270 if you can't well, win those states? I've got I wrote down all the states you just said, and I might check back in with you one day, and we'll assess how things went on election <laughs> night. Uh, Ed Morrissey, thank you very much. Always nice to, nice to talk to you from hot air, sir. Well, 